Uh, thank you very much for that generous introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I know uh, a little bit about the tasks that you face, the calling that God has given you. And uh, I thank God for you, that you've answered that call and that you're faithful to Jesus in telling people about the good news about Jesus, what he did, who he was, and what happened to him. So um, I'm a, I became a Christian when I was 10 years old, uh, didn't, didn't understand it very well. But then uh, when I was 15 years old, I, um, I attended a camp meeting in Greensboro, North Carolina. I grew up on a farm in Ararat, Virginia, Patrick County. And um, Billy Graham had the crusade in 1952 in Greensboro, North Carolina. And um, I went there with no intention of, of uh, making any kind of decision. I just went to see what was going on with a group of family and a carload my brother had gotten together with. And so anyway, at the end of the service, I found myself going forward. And, uh, and uh, we stood in front there and he explained the gospel again and again and again. And then um, we prayed and then we went backstage and had counseling by a dear Presbyterian minister who helped me understand uh, faith in Jesus Christ. And, and I'm thankful for those days. Um, I got um, away from the Lord uh, when I was uh, 16 years old, 1953. My brother was a moonshiner uh, making um, white, what they called white lightning or moonshine whiskey in the hills of West of, of Virginia, right near West Virginia. And so I got involved and I was intrigued. And I remember thinking uh, one day when I walked into the the liquor still down in the hollow by the creek and I remember thinking you know yes this is this is what I want to do I love this you know so I got involved in a, a, a significant way but through uh, the Lord's work um, the Lord's um, handling of the situation at the end of the summer I went off to a place called Bob Jones University and my brother went off to the penitentiary in Mill Point, West Virginia. And um, that was the dividing line of my life. And I met my wife at Bob Jones and we've had 57 years now of, um, of fellowship together with, uh, now we have 21 grandchildren, four children. And uh, through it all, through it all, I can look back and see the hand of God. And I'm so thankful for that. So, um, I'm just going to share a couple of things I've learned and, um, and some of the things we're trying to do. Um, God, I, I studied broadcasting and I met my brother-in-law there at Bob Jones, Edward Atzinger. And um, we began a partnership. I started a little radio station in Roanoke, Virginia, and um, one in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. But the Lord was calling me to do Christian radio. And uh, he called us to, uh, with Edward and I, um, called us to form, uh, I believe, Salem Media Group. Uh, it was, um, and the first time we really branched out and took a, took a big step, uh, we were in Boston at the Hilton Inn trying to buy a little station that didn't cover much uh, for not much money. And then one of it came available very big. So. Uh, Nancy, my wife, and my brother-in-law, Edward, and I got down on our knees. And we prayed, and somehow the phrase came out, why not the best facilities for the Lord? Why not the best broadcast facilities for the Lord? I think some of you probably prayed a prayer similar to that. And, and so I negotiated with the owner of the very, a very, very expensive and great radio station in Boston in 1968. And um, uh, that's 78, 1978, W-E-Z-E. -E, and he sold it to us on terms. And we were finally able to raise the money for it. It took a while, uh, second or third mortgage on our house. And we bought it and God blessed it. And, and so we kept doing that everywhere, all across the country. The top 50 markets we are affiliated with or have radio stations there, Christian radio stations, teaching talk, some music, and some um, conservative talk. 
So a few things I've learned. Um, great to have someone accountable, accountable to. I'm sure I want to assume that all of you have that. Someone in your church or your friend who's not in a church who holds you accountable. Um, and you can be talk very frank with, very honest with, um, because um, the temptations are great. They don't go away. And, and the opportunities to uh, do the shortcuts, as we call them. Um, the, um, uh, the lust of the flesh doesn't go away. And Satan is smart, and he knows where we're the weakest. So um, I'm, I'm just assuming you have someone you're accountable to. I have a brother-in-law I'm accountable to. I'm accountable to my wife. And we have no secrets whatsoever. And, um, and then I'm accountable to other friends who are here that, uh, that can call me out. And they do call me out and say, you're wrong on this. By the way, a, a book has just come out called Think Again. Yeah, you might already get that if this sort of thing uh, interests you. Think Again. And it's about the, uh, the strength and the power of knowing what you don't know. Huge book. Okay, I just heard today someone say that Socrates uh, said that the uh, admitted ignorance is the beginning of knowledge. So in a sense, we're all students the rest of our lives studying about God, wanting to know more about God and how, how we can deal with this. Uh, well, let me just use Paul's phrase, wretched man that I am and you are. How can we deal with that? on a day-to-day -day basis i thank god through jesus christ our lord as paul said it that's the great thing uh, one of the things i've uh, i i have learned is um, god has uh, it doesn't let up god you think you've got problems now um <laughs> you're going to have more problems and you're going to have bigger problems and they're going to be bigger, bigger challenges and, and then you turn over and meet, I, I, think, I think it's in Matthew 4, I'm not sure. It says that if, you, if the branches that don't bring any fruit, God's going to uh, cut them off and burn them up. But if you do bring fruit, he's going to prune you. He's going to prune me and so that we can bear more fruit. And sometimes that pruning, what, if you've been on a farm as I was, I, we did prune apple trees and plum trees and also um, peach trees every year. If you didn't prune them, the fruit became real bad, small, diluted, and uh, practically worthless. But if you prune them, cut a lot away, cut a lot of stuff away, then boy, you could, you'd have a good crop the next year. And so uh, the pruning takes place so that it gets bigger so we can go stronger. And then the challenge gets even bigger so we can, my, my grandson is lifting weights he, he's 220 now. He's uh, 18. He's going to Colorado State. He wants to play football. And he said, I've got to get up to two, 260, 220 to 260. And so he's, he's uh, bench pressing uh, 450 pounds. Can that be true? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I said, well, why do you keep adding more weights? And he says, well, I've got to if I want to be stronger. Okay, so we've got to accept this from God and rejoice in it, really, because God's way is more challenges, more opportunities. So that's how we become conquerors uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, one of the burdens of my heart, very frankly, and I would love to see you get involved in this, is, let me just call it like it is, fatherlessness in our country. Maybe you're involved already with uh, your church or some group of people. The fatherlessness in our country, and you know the statistics, 30, uh, maybe 35 percent of the, all kids born now in America are born to single parents, illegitimate, they, we used to call it. And um, of the Hispanics, it's about 43 percent. Among African Americans, it's 72 percent. There's something called Section 8 housing, which is government-assisted uh, housing, which, um, in my experience, we, we found that most of them are, um, most of the kids there are fatherless. 
their uh, mother um, gets more money, more welfare if the man is missing. Actually, it, strangely, it, um, it uh, in a way, in a strange way, it promotes fatherlessness by uh, making available um, more money if you don't have a man in the house. And that's the strange thing, but that's what's happening. So where are these kids gonna, gonna, gonna turn? Um, uh, 90% of them, 90% uh, of the poor kids, we'll classify them as poor, who show up for K-5 are, are deficient. They're, they're below grade in reading and other basic things. They're, they're behind everybody else. And then when they come back for uh, first grade, they're further behind, two years, actually two years behind at K-5, two years behind. And they're, they're, they're 90 percent of them, the statistics say, will never recover from that. They'll be behind all of their lives. So what do we do? What can we do? Well, we have to do something beyond what the government is doing now. And so we started a faith-based organization called um, CAYM, Christian Association of Youth Mentoring, which has about 5,000 kids working through churches, CAYM. You can uh, look it up on the internet, CAYM.com, I believe, or net, or maybe EDU, but look it up on the internet and you can get involved. We'd love to have you get involved in that. We'll, we'll come and train you and show you sharing your people or the designated person how to get your church involved in this huge thing. Uh, one of the things we've done through um, mentoring kids is known as um, uh, Kids Extreme. Uh, a few, oh, 12 years ago, uh, a gentleman I knew who was a real, real radical Christian, by that I mean he was really all out for the Lord. He was buying he wanted to make this uh, housing project with 100 apartments, 100 mothers, basically, and 350 children, um, make it into a Christian community. And so, but he didn't have any money. And he asked me, would I uh, be, the, be the buyer until he could get the money? So I got on it. And I put up put him some money at an escrow. And then he was 33 years old and was in Charleston, South Carolina, playing a pickup basketball game at the YMCA and fell over dead. So then the people calling me and said, when are we gonna close this apartment complex? And so I went over to find out what was going on. And so uh, I didn't know anyone. So I just sat down on a little uh, stone wall there and talked to everybody who came by. And this is what I found. I, women came by, no men really basically but women came by I said how are you doing tell me about your family uh well I'm raising these children these are you know I have three or four children three three children here I said what do you want them to be what's your dream and they told me you know an aviation pilot a fireman or a policeman or or doctor a lawyer they all had big dreams time after time and I said well tell me about your husband and they would say no I don't have a husband um I, I had a boyfriend, it's not working out. And then most of them would say something like, um, you understand, I didn't start out like this. I didn't want it to end up like this. But this is kind of just, it just kind of happened to me. This kind of happened to me fooling around when I was a teenager. Well, tell me about your father. And I said, well, I, I, I never really knew my, my dad. I didn't, I didn't know him at all. And did you ever live with him? No, not, not really. And sometimes they'd say maybe a little bit at first, but then he was gone. So fatherlessness, I, I, all of you are familiar with the scripture, you know, behold what manner of the love that God has given to us that we could be called the children of God. We're God's children. He's our father. That's what he said. I want you to call me our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name and so now we have the same name i'm a father i'm a grandfather in fact i'm a great grandfather one great one great grandchild and i'm so proud of all of them and so far they're following the lord thank goodness and i have that responsibility i can't walk away from it i just cannot i would die before i walk away from that so somehow we have to got to get involved with this 
And so I have a video I'd like played right now that give you the idea that we're doing. And I would like for your church to find a way. There's a Section 8 housing development near your church. And there's someone in your church who would like to reach these kids who don't have fathers. And so uh, look at this. If it makes sense, if something says something to you, then we'll be glad to give you more information on how you can get involved. We'll show you exactly how to do it. We've been doing it about 12 years now. And we've seen some glorious, glorious, uh, great things happen in the lives of children, fatherless children who were going to go to, cry, uh, to prison, to jail, drugs, uh, suicide, all of that. And if, even if they escape those things, about 90% of them are going to be behind in education and achievement and a job. And they're just going to be um, kind of the underlings. Uh, it's a class situation. You know, it's so sad. So it breaks your heart to talk to kids like this. They all want to talk with you. I go over there. I used to go over before the COVID and take, you know, 50 hamburgers from McDonald's. They give me a dollar each. I go over there, crowd around the car, give them a hamburger. We just have a conversation about Jesus, you know. So anyway, um, that's what I want to play. Okay, let me let me. Uh, uh, the, right now, we'll have the video. Here in Washington Heights, hope is not something you hear or see on a daily basis. Good morning, kids. Come on down. Y'all ready for kids and scream? Uh, come on down. This is what I do on every Saturday morning. You come to kids and scream? All right. I come out and I round up the kids. They come from this side. They come from every side because they know every Saturday that they can listen to a word of God and, and their lives be transformed. And they're just so happy. Y'all happy? Yeah. About two and a half years ago, uh, four of us sat at a table to talk about how could we bring hope to a hopeless hospital community. Well, well, welcome uh, to Kids Extreme, everybody. I'm glad that you gather here. And what you will experience here today is the heartbeat of what we talked about at that table. I feel they're up against struggles. Some of them have challenges with education. They have challenges with waking up in the morning on time, clean clothes. They have challenges with, where's my father? Just this morning, the child gave me two bullet shells. She's three, but she knew what a bullet was at three. So the challenges they are facing are numerous, but at the same time, there's hope every Saturday morning through Kids Extreme. They waited a whole week to see us, and it's a big deal to see them. It's a big deal. We're here to change lives. Oh, 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 how sweet the sound. Just watching the kids' smiles when we're singing the songs and we're praising God. Are you ready for oh, 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 how sweet the sound. Praise, praise, praise. That's, that's all that matters now. Praise, praise, praise. If they cannot shut me down. Praise, praise, praise. That's, that, that's all that matters. The thing I love about kids to stream is how they let us dance. Oh, 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 how sweet the sound. The music playing and Pastor Eddie telling us about God that I never knew about. Oh, 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 how sweet the sound. At Kids Extreme, we realize again that we have tons of fun. We share the gospel, we build a relationship. But more importantly, this is their church. Where is our home? It's in heaven. That's where our real home is, is in heaven. And Jesus on the cross is paving the way for us to get back to heaven. They may not get an opportunity to go to a formal church like we may have the privilege to, 
but this is the little church that they may get, and we want to make an incredible difference in their life. We want to build their character. We want to build their self-esteem, and also we want to be able to lead them to Christ. Because he was willing to do what God sent him to do, now he's in heaven and he's the king. Well, I started coming to Kansas and um, It was some trouble because I started getting in fights a lot and stuff. And now I had a lot of coming. I started learning, learning more about God and how he wanted me to obey him, learn about him, and how he likes me to read the Bible because at home I got five Bibles. I used to um, not read the Bible, but now I do every day. I feel uh, so happy because my kids learning more and more about the Bible, about Jesus, and it brings real excitement to me because my kids want to come back here. What Kids Extreme does for the moms is first they give them a break on Saturday mornings, but it also let them know that somebody care about their children. It feel like I'm in a church surrounded by family, friends, and I thank God for that. And I love them so much because he changed me and my kids. They're special. God said he so loved the world that he gave. It's up to us to give back what was freely given to us. What's his love? So what's left in this community to do is just keep giving, keep embracing. But if I could just show up and let them know that Jesus loved them, I love them, and we together can make a difference. It's about sharing the love of Christ and speaking into the future 20 or 30 years from now, making an impact on these kids' lives. That's what Kids Extreme is all about. This is our ground zero, and we can make a difference here. So there you have it. Uh, that's a that tells a pretty much story. If you're interested in getting involved, getting in touch with us, if you need, uh, I know every church I know of has budget constraints. If you need uh, some help financially, we'll find that for you. Um, a fatherhood. We we've recently got involved with um, the Better Dads Society. The root cause of this is fathers. Men have abdicated their position as head of the family. Uh, father of the children, not taking responsibility. Black, white, yellow, all races are doing this multiple times. And indeed, some things about our government encourage them to do that. So we got to reach the fathers, get the fathers back in the family, get the family, Bob, the fathers back in the church. So that's basically um, one of the things we're trying to do. So now if you have some questions, I'll be, had to, be happy to um, answer them or try to. I, I would, uh, I, I have only an opinion in my own experience. Um, it, I, I think there's several, lots of reasons, um, individual reasons, but I think, um, our churches are not grounding our young people in the word um, as much as they should be. Memor scripture memorization has been very important in my family, and it's still important. Uh, my wife is celebrating her 80th birthday. Uh, she was born in Hawaii just before Pearl Harbor occurred. And she, uh, we're going back there, and we're offering an incentive to all of our grandchildren if you memorize Romans 8, all 39 verses um, that we will, um, and they're working on it. So uh, incentivize young people to memorize scripture, just find a way, a word I've hit in my heart. And then the school they go to is very important. If they're really strong Christians and have fellowship with people who are there, um, then maybe a secular school works okay. Some schools have the announced uh, Baptist, you know, Baptist schools have, some of them have a, announced uh, in the religious department, I want to get you out of this old fashioned religion that you talk about being born again. And uh, it's just anti-God. It's a terrible atmosphere to send a child to. So that's kind of rambling, but 
um, having a conversation with a young person and uh, with, with someone who knows the scriptures very well and is close to Christ uh, can be an eye opener for them. So I would, I would encourage that. A frank conversation, not a preaching conversation, but a, and I have that all the time with my, with my grandchildren and other young men and young women I meet, all of them I meet, I try to engage in a conversation about Jesus. So that's, um, that's what I would recommend, but it's a tragedy what's happening. 75% of the Southern Baptist kids drop out in the first year when they go off to college. Yes, thank you, Pastor. I also believe that we need to engage each other more in fellowship and have more conversations centered around Jesus and not around things of the world. Nowadays, it's, it's hard to find um, youths having conversations about the Word of God. And I think mm -hmm. uh, it, that's one of the that we have during the CLF is, is to go back to the Word of God and to awaken our faith in God. So, yeah, thank you, Pastor, for, for answering yeah. my question. Like, uh, okay, you got the kids that you know who's kind of a weak in their faith. Uh, you ask, do you think Jesus actually lived on this earth? Tell me what you think about it. You think God came down and actually walked among people here and they saw him and touched him? What are, you, what are your ideas on it? Okay. And, and most kids will talk with you. That's a difficult question. Um, I would I would on um, only advise um, you in a in a deliberate, very concentrated way. Um, search the scriptures yourself, study them, uh, memorize key verses, maybe key chapters. And just kind of saturate yourself with Christians and pray to the Lord that the Holy Spirit would make your life, that they would see you, you know, let your light shine, that they would see you and glorify God. And they will see there's something different. There's something very desirable that Julie has that, that I don't have. And um, I've seen this happen over and over again people who are drawn and it's Jesus in you. Christ came to confront evil and came into the world to show us what God looked like and, and, and tell us about God and show us about God. And in, 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 and everywhere he went, he was touching people who were, who were undesirable and it changed them instead of them changing him the Pharisees and scribes said, stay away from those people. They're, they're, you know, but Jesus came and associated with them. He touched the leper and he didn't get defiled, but the leper got healed. So what Jesus changed, he reversed it. He changed, he changed it for good. And that's what the Pharisees and the scribes could not, could not stand. So most of the, I think most of the doubting comes from people associating with people who claim to be Christians, who have serious deficiencies in their lives. And, and we're all kind of like that, by the way. We all have deficiencies in our lives. But the power of the Holy Spirit can change, can use you, okay, as you walk close to him, uh, can use you to change people's notion their ideas about God. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I, I, I've seen it work. <laughs>